Mark chapter 7, we got two miracles that are happening. Everybody say two miracles. We got the casting out of a demon, Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 30. How many of you believe in demons? Even if you don't believe in them, listen, there are demons. And uh, demons are true, demons are real. You say, how do you know there's demons that exist? Well, you know what, I, ha I just have to share this. I believe it's the Lord, I put it on Facebook. Very, very important for us to understand that all of a sudden, everybody in the United States is caring about children. You know, children not being separated from the parents, which again, I agree with, that's a bad thing. But I'm sitting there, all of a sudden, all these people, politicians, whatever, were starting to care about children. And I have one thing to say, why are we killing children then in the womb? If we really care about children, how many of you know there won't be another abortion in the United States of America? How come everybody's not praising the Lord? I just had to get that off, off of my mind. How many of you really care about children? Then how many of you know children are people? They are individuals. That's not a glob there. That's not just a bunch of things that are there. My daughter, she's pregnant. We're going to have her third grandchild. It's a little girl. She just had, her, um, just had her sonogram, and it was just cool. You can see the head. You can see the arms. You can see the heart beating because they can do three- and four-dimensional um, uh, pictures now of the children there, and the, that, that is an individual. We saw it yesterday. That is an individual, and that is a person. In fact, Katie said while they were doing the uh, sonogram there, while they were doing that with the machine, she could just feel. It was a little girl punching her in the stomach. I said, good. The Lord's getting you back for all the times you punched us in the stomach over all those years. How many of you know the Lord comes through for his parents? Can you say amen? Casting out a demon. You say, well, pastor, why'd you say that? Because it's demonic for there to be abortions. It's a demonic thing. It's a devilish thing. How many of you know the Lord doesn't want us to kill kids? He wants us to raise them and have them. How many of you are glad somebody let you be born? Can you say amen? I, I tell you, we need to let people, let people live. You know what? I believe I need to say this too. If for some reason you have had an abortion, how many of you know that God forgives? But no more. Come on, everybody praise the Lord. God forgives you. But how many of you know no more? No more. The second, the second miracle that's here is in Mark 7, 31 to 37. It's talking about healing. So let's look at verse 24 as we're in Mark 7. From there he arose, that's Jesus. Where did he arise from? He arose from a different part of Israel. He was up north in Galilee, which it is called. Capernaum, which was his hometown, Peter's hometown. And he, uh, when Jesus was in Capernaum, he stayed with Peter. When I was in Israel, I saw the house of Peter. They had just dug it up from the mud over all the years. And Peter lived right on the Sea of Galilee. So from there, Jesus arose rose by the Sea of Galilee, and he went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Remember last week, for those of you who weren't here or were here, remember that is Gentile territory, Gentile territory. We need to understand that Tyre and Sidon today would be modern Lebanon, if you're looking at a map. And he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. How many of you know when Jesus is around, it can't be hidden because things start happening? How many of you know you can't hide Jesus tonight because you can feel his presence? He is here in our midst, and he is real. And it says here, for a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was Greek, a Syrophoenician, which means she was from southern Syria by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs, which is the Gentiles. And she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, even the little dogs, Gentiles, under the table eat from the children's crumbs. The Lord was giving his plan to her, that he came to Israel first and then to those of us that are Gentiles. How many of you are glad he came to those that are Jewish and those that are Gentile? I'm sure I'm glad. Then he said to her, for this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter was lying on the bed. How many of you are glad that we can cast out demons and we have all authority over every power of hell in the name of Jesus? Can you say amen? Oh, I want to share with you a few things that we can learn from these verses. First of all, number one, the first principle we can learn from verses 24 to 30, going past what I shared last week, is this, is that no one is beyond salvation. No one is beyond salvation. How many of you are glad that the Lord can save anyone, no matter what their sins are, no matter what their color is, no matter what their background is, no matter how bad they've sinned, no matter if they do drugs, no matter if they're gay, I don't care who they are, I don't care what they've done, no one is beyond salvation. How many of you are glad that God looked at you and he didn't say, oh man, you're so bad that there's no hope for you? How many of you understand that the Lord looked down and says, I don't care how bad you are, I came to earth in the form of man, Jesus Christ, and I died and I rose again, and I can break the power of sin in anybody's life that they can be saved, can you say amen. How many of you believe every drug dealer can be saved in Pasco County? 
That's not everybody. Come on, how many of you believe that God can save every alcoholic in Pasco County? How many of you believe that God can save every prostitute in Pasco County? How many of you are glad that God can save every homeless person in Pasco County? How many of you are glad that God can save every one of your neighbors and he saved you because no one is beyond being saved and born again? So we have to understand a couple things. Number one, we need to understand that the Lord wants everybody saved. He wants everybody saved. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 8 to 9. Now keep your hand in Mark because we'll zip right back, right, back, right back there. But here in 2 Peter chapter 3, we, we have to understand that. That the Lord created everybody and he created everybody to have fellowship with him. And he created everybody to have a relationship with him. So he wants everybody that is born again to be born again. He wants everybody to be saved. It says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, Beloved, born again believers, do not forget this one thing. Now look what he says. Don't forget this one thing. That with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some count slowness, but is long-suffering or patient toward us, not willing that what? Any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So how many of you know here in Pasco County, this is our territory. He wishes that none should perish, but but that all should come to repentance. Not only do we need to understand that the Lord wants everybody saved, but we need to understand that everyone can be saved. There isn't somebody out there that is too tough that can't be saved. We've all heard of this, what, MS-13 gang that's in the United States from other nations. I don't look at the individual. I don't look that they're a gang member. I look that they are a creation of God. You say, God created them? Yes, but they are lost. They were without Jesus Christ. They are in the flesh big time. But how many of you know God can save them? God can turn their lives lives around. There isn't one person God can't touch, God can't convict, and God can't bring to him. Aren't you glad he saved you? If he saved you, he can save anybody. So everyone can be saved. And thirdly, the believer should want everybody to be saved. There isn't anybody I don't want to be saved. I don't care what they've done. A lot of our family, a lot of our people in here, men and women, they visit the jails. There's murderers in the jails. There's rapists in the jails. And I feel bad that they did that, whatever, but I still want them born again because I don't want anybody to go to hell. There isn't anybody I can look at regardless of what they've done and say, you know, well, they're so bad or they've done such heinous things that I just don't want them to be born again. We need to witness to everyone. We need to witness to anyone. We need to tell them the good news of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And even on their deathbed, bed when they're walking down to die because they've killed someone. How many of you know the Lord can still save them and turn their life around and they can come to know Christ as their personal Savior and Lord? Come on, everybody give the Lord praise. Can you do that? We need to want everybody to be saved and born again. Now, very, very important that we don't look at the person and we don't look at the problem. Sometimes we look at the people. When I was street witnessing down in Fort Wayne, Indiana, I'd look at some of those people and I'd just go, whoa, man, big dudes, tattoos all over. Man, they looked like they were going to kill me and club me to death. But how many of you know i got to get my eyes off the person and i got to get my eyes off of the problem? An MS-13 gang member. They're a gang member. Sometimes when we witness here in Newport Ritchie, we will go and knock on the door and all of a sudden we, they open the door and you get high just with the smoke that's coming out of the house. And you kind of look in the house, you say, there's some strange characters that live in Newport Ritchie. How many of you know there's a few strange characters that live in our area? Can you say amen? Uh, as I look around, there could be some here even on Thursday night, but that's beside the point. How many of you know there's some strange characters out there? But guess what? I'm not looking at the person, and I'm not looking at the problem. What am I looking at? I'm looking at the fact that they have a sin nature. I don't look at the symptom of the sin nature. You see, we as born-again believers, we look at the symptom of the sin nature. Drugs is a symptom of the root problem. Alcohol is a symptom of the root problem. Being a gang member is a symptom of the root problem. Being gay is a symptom of the root problem. What is the root problem? We were all born with a sin nature, and that sin nature can produce a lot of different types of symptoms and a lot of different types of sin. So no matter who I'm witnessing to, if they're doing drugs, well, that's the way it is. If they're a gang member, that's the way it is. If they're just a religious person, that's the way it is is. It doesn't bother me at all. I don't look at that. They have a sin nature, and I know somebody who can break the power of sin in their life, and his name is Jesus. Does anybody believe that tonight? Does anybody believe that's happening down in Mexico to our team member? 
They're not looking at all the problems that are down there. They are looking at the fact that that person needs Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. You see, God's people, get your eyes off the person, get your eyes off the problem, get your eyes on the fact that every individual has a sin nature, and the power of sin can be broken by the power of the blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I did a lot of drinking, and that was my main issue, but when my roommate looked at me, he didn't look at the alcohol. He looked at the fact that I was a lost person. I was a sinner. I was away from Christ. He didn't care really about the alcohol and all the things that I were doing. He said, Bill, you have a sin nature, but I know somebody who can break the power of the sin nature, and when the power of the sin nature is broken, how many of you know you don't sell your body anymore? How many of you know you don't go down and get drunk anymore? How many of you know you don't sell drugs anymore? How many of you know you come out of that gang, get out of that gang, even if it's a couple years later? How many of you know God saves you and cleans you up and changes your life? Can you say amen? Now, this mom here in verse 26, she was a woman. She had, she was, it says here that she was Greek. That means she spoke the Greek language. She was from Syria. When it says Syrophoenician by birth, that's talking about southern Syria. Now, Jewish society at this time did not think any Gentile could be saved. Here's what one rabbi said. It's a quote. Gentiles, all Gentiles are simply fuel for the fires of hell. So during that society, back at that time, they didn't want anything to do with Gentiles. They were just dirty dogs. They were all just fuel for the fire of hell. And they thought it was impossible for somebody to be saved that was a Gentile. But how many of you are glad that this story is telling us something about the Gentiles, that no one is beyond salvation? How many of you are glad that Jesus looked at her and says, I don't care that you're a woman because they looked down on women at that time. I don't care that you're a Gentile. I don't care that your daughter is demon-possessed. I don't care that you have issues. It doesn't make any difference to me. I came for Gentiles, and I came for Jewish people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He came for everyone. Society thought this person was beyond salvation. How many of you know there's even people today in our society that think some people people are beyond being saved, beyond being rehabbed, beyond being held. But guess what? There isn't one person in our nation that is beyond salvation, that is beyond redemption, that is beyond hope. They do have hope, but it isn't in all the things the world gives. It's in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? So we see here, let's turn if we could please to Matthew 15. You say, why Matthew 15? Because it tells the story also of this woman. But it just gives a little bit more detail, so I thought I'd come out of Mark just for a little bit. Because this mom here, it's, it's between verses 21 and verse 28 in Matthew 15. This mom here who people thought couldn't be saved, guess what happened to her? She got born again and she got saved. She started off in verse 22. If we can look at verse 22 in chapter 15. This woman of Cain and I came from that region and cried out to him saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. If you'll notice here, she calls Jesus, first of all, son of David. This was simply a Jewish title back then, but not a recognition that he was her savior. So at this point in time when she's saying, You're son of David, she was saying, I don't believe you're my savior. So she was not born again yet. Born again yet. But if you notice down in verse 28, all of a sudden she begins to place her faith in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Look what it says here. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be done to you as you desire. So she starts off calling him the son of David. And then if you'll notice in verse 25, look what it says. It says, Lord, I want you to help me. Now she calls him Lord. In verse 27, she calls him again Lord. In verse 25, now she begins begins to worship him. You say, what happened to that woman? She went from just calling him son of David to saying, you are my Lord. And the Lord says, you have great faith because you've not only placed your faith in me to believe that I can heal your daughter and get that demon cast out, but you've also put faith in me to believe that I am not just the son of David. I am not just a person with a title, but I am the Lord God of heaven. And she bowed down and began to worship him and praise him because how many of you know, she said, you are not only, my, you are not only the one who's a healer and a deliverer, but you are 
are God Almighty. You are King of kings, and you are Lord of lords. And guess what happened to this woman that everybody said couldn't get saved? She got saved and born again. Listen, some of you are here tonight, and you're thinking of an individual. I don't think they'll ever get saved. I don't think they'll ever come to Christ. Pastor, you just don't know anything about them. They have a mental condition. They're this and they're that. I don't care what their condition is. God is a healer. God is a deliverer. God can touch anyone. God can change the situation. If he touched this woman, he touched you, he can touch them. Now the daughter, look at verses 29 and 30 back in Mark chapter 7. So in Mark chapter 7, we see that now the daughter is involved in this story. And he said to the woman in verse 29, For this saying, go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out of her daughter, lying on the bed. The daughter was also a Syrian. The daughter was also an unbeliever. The daughter was also possessed by a demon. And again, I said it last week, but let me say it again. If you are a born-again believer, is anybody born again tonight? If you're a born-again believer, you can never, ever be possessed by a demon. Don't you even worry about it. It cannot happen. It is impossible. You are temples of the Holy Spirit. God lives with within you now the hope of glory. But when you're an unbeliever, you can be demon-possessed. You can be demon-possessed. And this girl was. But guess what happened? When the mom came to the home, the demon came out. And guess what happened? She not only got delivered, but she got saved. You see, the Lord didn't heal anybody just to have a good church service. The Lord didn't deliver people so people would dance. Every time somebody is healed and delivered by the Lord, they are also born again through the blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So guess what happened to this daughter? She was unsaved. People didn't think she could get saved also. She's demon-possessed. She's mentally ill. Listen, I've dealt with demon-possessed people. Their voice is different. This girl probably had a voice of a man. She was probably going through some good... She, the demons can also put great strength in you. One person with a demon can wrestle six or seven people and throw them to the ground. So everybody was saying, this mom can't be saved and this daughter can't be saved. She's demon-possessed. Something is wrong with her. She's mentally ill. She's doing drugs. Oh, man, it's just unbelievable what is going on in her life. Let's just throw her to the side and let's just chain her to a tree. But I'm sitting here today saying this, any drug dealer in Newport Ritchie can be born again. Anybody who is doing meth can be born again. Anybody who is smoking weed can be born again. Anybody who is walking the streets can be born again. Anybody that society has given up on can be born again through the blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? The second point that I got out of these, number, number two, turn with me to Genesis chapter 32, please. Genesis chapter 32. The second lesson the Lord teaches us is not only that no one is beyond redemption, but secondly, persistence is a key in living a victorious life. Persistence is a key in living a victorious life. This woman heard Jesus was in the area, so guess what she did? She approached Jesus because she knew that he was the answer as you're turning to Genesis 26, 32. And we see here that in verse 26, as I taught last week, she kept asking Jesus. She persisted. You see, to receive many things from the Lord, we must all be persistent and we must keep on asking. If it goes along with his will and his word, it will happen, no matter what we see, no matter how we feel, and no matter what is going on. I think our society a little bit has turned a little wimpy. It's turned a little wimpy in sports. It's turned a little wimpy in the church. And when we don't see something happening within six months or a year or even a couple years, we kind of whine and complain and we quit Jesus and we quit church and God's not going to answer and God's not going to come through. I'm here to tell you that is a lie from the enemy. My Bible says you got to keep asking. This woman, she kept asking. 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 <laughs> You say, what did she do after she kept asking? She kept asking, and she kept asking, and she kept asking, and she kept asking. And guess what happened when she kept asking? God finally came through. The Lord delivered that little girl from that, de from that demon, and all of a sudden she was saved and born again and came to her senses. I don't know what you're believing the Lord for. I don't know what you're going through, but all of us are going through something. But guess what we're all going to do? We are not going to whine. We are not going to complain. We're not going to get on Facebook and tell all the drama that is going on in the situation. We're not going to say, 
I'm not going to read my Bible anymore. I'm not going to church anymore. We're not going to put all that garbage on the, on the, on the uh, Facebook or on Instagram. What we're going to do is if we go on Facebook, we're going to say, you know what? I'm in year two, and all of a sudden my prayer still hasn't been answered yet. But listen, it is going to be answered. By faith, I, I believe it's going to be manifested quickly. God is going to come through for me. So those of you that are out there reading this post and you're going through a hard time, you keep asking and 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 and God's going to save that person. God's going to heal that person. God's going to come through for you. God's going to give you that job. (laughs) Hello, anybody here tonight? God's going to take care of you. God's going to provide. No whining. No whining. Turn to somebody and say, no whining, no whining. Turn to somebody and say, no more drama on Facebook. Come on, man. Come on, man. Boy, every time I read from somebody from the church, I, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't look at all their stuff on their own sites, but, you know, it just comes on the news feed, and I sit there and go, why are they saying that? Why in the world are they putting that on there? Why are they whining about things that are going to happen? How many of you know God's going to come through? you got to keep asking. Well, I've been asking for three weeks. How about five years? Come on, anybody willing to wait for five years and still be faithful? That's half of you. I'll take that. Anybody willing to wait six years? Come on, anybody willing to wait 10 years? Anybody willing to wait 40 years for your marriage to be turned around, for the thing to be answered, for a healing to come? How many of you know we have to persist? And you can't give up. Here in Genesis chapter 32, verse 22, he arose, who's he? Jacob. He arose that night and he took his two wives. How many of you know one's enough? Can you say amen? One's enough. That's in my translation. He took his two wives, but one's enough. And his two female servants and his 11 sons, unless you're married to somebody like Susie, and then it's, it's she's here, so I had to say that. I just, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and there was a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. So they're wrestling all night. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. Who was he wrestling with? He was wrestling with the Lord. But he said, look at this. Oh, I love this. Come on, underline it. We all need to underline this in our Bibles. I will not let you go until you bless me. Did you underline that? You got your yellow marker? Come on, mark that. I will not let you go, Lord, unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? Jacob. He said, no, your name's not Jacob any longer. You're Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men. And look at this. You have prevailed. And then Jacob answered saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Peniel. And Peniel means to see the Lord face to face. The sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Therefore to this day the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the muscle that shrank. I love this verse where it says back there, in verse 26, he said, I will not let go until you bless me. I will not let go until you heal me. I will not let go until you fulfill the dream that is in my life. I will not let go till you save my family. I will not let go till my kids are back to you. I will not let go till I'm financially free. I will not let go until you give me the miracle that I'm asking for. I will not let go until you bring revival to Newport Ritchie. I will not let go till everybody at CCWC is on fire for the Lord. I will not let go. I will not give up. I will not quit. I will persist. And if I persist, God will hear and answer all my prayers. Can you say amen? Let's go back to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter, I should quit after that. But I'm not going to because I got to persist. Matthew 15, verse 22. Here's the third principle from these verses. Spiritual desperation is vital to receptivity. Spiritual desperation is vital to receptivity. This woman here in Matthew 15 and verse 22. Have mercy on me. 
O son of David. She cried out to him, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Have mercy on me. How many of you know she was desperate? And when we as born-again believers will become desperate, then we are receptive to hear from the Lord and to go after the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. I say this to all of us. What is it going to take for to see tears to come down our cheeks for our nation? What is it going to take for us to really come before the Lord and say, Lord, I need you. I need you as a husband. I need you as a grandfather. I need you as a father. I need you as a pastor. I need you as a worker. I need you as a born-again believer. What is it going to take in my life, in our lives, in our church, and in our nation for us to hunger and thirst after the Lord in a way that we never have before? Is it going to have to take trouble? Come on, is it going to have to take trouble? Here's what I vote for that. I vote no. Lord, I don't want to have to have trouble in my life to be in a prayer meeting. I don't want to have to have trouble in my life to start to tithe. I don't want to have to have trouble in my life to finally start reading the word and be faithful to you. I don't want to go through that anymore. I'm tired of that cycle. When there's trouble, I'm after the Lord. When it gets calm, then I'm just going to go back to my routine. Then trouble again, and I'm back to you, Lord. And when it's gone, I'm just going to go back to my old routine. Whether you're going through trouble or whether there was no trouble, I'm praying for all of us that there will be a desperation and a hunger that will grip our hearts for the things of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we will never ever be the same come on anybody want that fire that's not everybody come on everybody everybody want that hunger do you really lay hands on somebody and ask God to put a spiritual hunger in their hearts put a spiritual hunger in their hearts come on pray for them God put a spiritual hunger in their hearts put a spiritual hunger in our hearts for you Lord Help us to be desperate for you, Jesus. Help us to be desperate for you, Jesus. Help us to be desperate for you, Lord. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. We'll end with this tonight. Verses 31 through 37. A healing of a deaf mute. How many of you believe that the Lord can heal anyone? The Lord now takes off from Tyre and Sion, modern Lebanon, in verse 31. He's going from Gentile territory, and now he's going from Gentile territory to where does he end up? He's in the region of the Decapolis on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. That's also Gentile territory. Decapolis means a ten-city region. So he goes from Lebanon... And he goes over to what would be today the nation of Syria, to a place called the Decapolis, a ten-city ten area, and it's right on the Sea of Galilee. As you get to go to Israel, you can actually look over the Sea of Galilee and see where the Decapolis was, where Jesus actually walked. And look what they did. They brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on them. Don't you love these people? Look in verse 32. They brought somebody to Jesus. Would you please bring somebody to Jesus? You say, Pastor, I'll bring them to church. No, I didn't say bring them to church. Bring them to Jesus. Does anybody here know a neighbor, a friend, a family member, a co-worker that doesn't know Jesus as their personal Savior and Lord? Guess what you need to do? You need to bring them to Jesus. You need to pop the question. This man had a problem. He was deaf. He couldn't speak very well. He could hardly talk. He could not communicate clearly. So there were two ailments. This man had a double ailment, but how many of you are glad there's a double portion of the Holy Spirit for a double ailment? Can you say amen? Everybody say double portion. Now look, he takes the man to the side from the multitude. You say, why in the world would he take the man and take him to the side? Why not do it openly? The reason for that is because Jesus did not want to emphasize a healing and a miracle ministry. Jesus wanted to emphasize a word ministry and a salvation ministry. So he said, look, I don't want people to think this is a circus and we're just going to lay hands on people. They're going to fall on the carpet and all this miracle. You come to the side because there's more than miracles and there's more than healings. How many of you know we need to know the word of God? And we need to make sure that we stay on track and get people redeemed. So he said, I'm going to take you to the side. And he put his fingers in his ears. You say, that's weird. Well, don't call Jesus weird. He's not weird. How many of you know we've just become so normal that we think something like this is weird? I wish things like this would happen in the church age today again. It would be awesome. Can you imagine coming up after service tonight and somebody puts their fingers in your ear and prays for healing? 
All I can say is I hope your ears are clean. Can you see amen? Get that wax. Get that wax off your fingers there. We need to have those little cotton things to swab your ears before we put our fingers in it tonight. He took him aside from the multitude. He put his fingers in his ears. Oh, no. Now what did he do? He spit. <laughs> Get ready, Ed. And what did he do? He touched what? You guys are ready for some healings tonight, aren't you? You say, I would never let anything like this happen to me. Then you wouldn't have gotten healed. Now, this isn't normal. And this isn't what's going to happen tonight. I'm just having fun. But we need to understand sometimes when something for us is abnormal, that's when God truly is moving. That's when God truly is doing something. You know what, if I'm desperate for the Lord, whatever he says, I'm going to obey him and I'm going to follow him because I, I want to get healed. Anybody want to get healed? That's not everybody. Do you really want to get healed? Even if it's something that's out of the norm that the Lord, that you know the Lord really wants to do? Put his fingers in his ears. He spit, touched the man's tongue. And then look what he did. He looked up to heaven. You say, why in the world did he look up into heaven? He looked up to heaven because he's always pointing people to God. He's saying, I want you to know this isn't about me. This is about God. I want you to know tonight, this isn't about Calvary Chapel Worship Center. This is about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are pointing everyone to him. How many of you know he's the only one who can heal? He's the only one who can save? He's the only one who can change. So he pointed up to heaven, and he sighed. It was talking about prayer, not disgust. It was kind of a sigh of prayer. And he said to him, Epaphatha. That is, be opened, be released. In the Greek, it means to open completely. And immediately, the man's ears were opened. And the impediment of his tongue was loosed. And he spoke plainly. Isn't that awesome and wonderful? What happened to this man? This man was not only healed, but he was saved and born again through the blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Healed and saved. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one, but the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The words in verse 37, and I'll close with this, where it says they were astonished beyond measure, I looked it up. They were totally and completely overwhelmed. The people couldn't even stand on their feet. They couldn't believe what was taking place. And in the Greek, they were in a condition of amazement, and it continued for hours and days. As this man was totally healed, they fell over the people that were watching. We can't believe this. This is so unreal. I just had a family come up to me, and they went to the doctor, and there's things that are going in their body, and things had changed completely. And they said the doctor just kind of stepped back and says, I don't, I don't know what did this. I don't know what happened. I'm here to tell you, I know what happened. Wouldn't that be awesome if all of us would leave this place and start to lay hands on the sick, win people to Christ, get people baptized in the Holy Spirit, and people are just falling over, not because they're rich. I just can't believe that happened to my son. I can't believe my daughter was demon-possessed. There's no demon anymore. I can't believe it. What took place? Jesus took place. Does anybody believe the Lord can do that? I don't believe that you believe it. If you really believe it, win somebody to Christ tomorrow. Come on, if you really believe it, lay hands on somebody tomorrow. Come on, if you really believe it, if there's demon oppressions, cast that demon out in the name of Jesus. How many of you know our community needs to be astonished of the things that are happening? There's a buzz about Newport Richie, and you know what the buzz is about? Drugs, because that word is attached to drugs. Let's put it over to the spiritual. Let's start to have a buzz in our community about Jesus. What happened over here? Somebody got saved. What happened over here? Somebody got saved. I can't believe Fred got saved. There's no way he got saved. Yeah, he's saved and born again. Hey, the town drunk got saved. Hey, I noticed there's no prostitutes on the, on the 19 anymore. That's because people are getting saved and born again. All of a sudden, something's changed in their life. Oh, the amount of drugs that's in our community isn't as much. That's because people are getting saved and born again through the blood of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let the county commissions be astonished. 
Come on, let the mayor be astonished. Let preachers that don't believe it be astonished and follow. What, what's happening in our community? I'll tell you what's happening. Jesus is alive. Jesus is the answer. Revival is taking place. Woo! Come on, everybody give the Lord praise. It can happen. Be a part of it.